Hello. Today I'm going to talk about the German decision to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. This is the first part of uh, two videos on Operation Barbarossa, uh, which is Chapter 4 of Alistair Parker's The Second World War. Parker considers Hitler's decision to attack the Soviet Union as being the most important he made. Made in 1940, it seemingly was a settled aim, as per Mein Kampf uh, in 1924, where he had urged territorial expansion to create a living space for the German people in Russia and its border states. In June 1940, Hitler opined at least twice that Britain would soon be ready for what he termed a reasonable peace, so that he would have then have a free hand for his true task of the struggle with Soviet Bolshevism. On the 3rd of July, the German army began to plan for an attack on the Soviet Union, but persuaded Hitler that more time was needed to prepare so that an attack in late 1940 would be impossible. A date of May 1941 was set as the earliest possible. As Britain had still not sought peace, defeating the Soviet Union would also extinguish any final hopes Britain or its American supporter might have about curtailing German power in Europe. Germany would be able to seize the Ukraine, white Russia, modern Belarus, and the Baltic states. Yet, Britain's continued resistance gave pause to thought. To invade the Soviet Union would lead to a two-front war, and for the moment, the Soviet Union was willing to provide Germany with the food and minerals it needed. But again, an early attack would obviate having to deal with the powerful United States. In 1941, its resources would still be negligible, but by 1942, they would be significant, and after that, formidable. Britain would also then be hard to invade and would require much effort. So it made sense to deal with the Soviet Union as soon as possible before confronting Britain and the United States in earnest. As it would only require the Germans thought, or Hitler at least, uh, as it would require a single campaign only to crush the Soviet Union, this would also empower Japan, which could then threaten America in the East. War may have been inevitable anyway. As Nazi Germany based its legitimacy on force, security was not possible as long as a rival force still existed. Given all these uncertainties, Hitler hesitated. As he later explained in February 1945, Stalin was, after all, a realist, and perhaps a durable entente could be sustained based on mutual economic interest. In October 1940, Hitler even took up the scheme favoured by the foreign minister von Wippentrop and the navy chiefs for a joint anti-British campaign involving Spain, France, Italy, Russia and Japan, as well as Germany. This ignored the contrary interests of Italy, Spain and France. Franco, for his part, refused to be involved. Pétain avoided making a definite commitment. And Stalin made counter-proposals involving a greater Soviet role in Finland and the Balkans. Italy's invasion of Greece proved to be futile. Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister, had arrived in Berlin with Stalin's proposals on the 26th of November 1940. This convinced Hitler that a compromise with Stalin just wasn't possible. The Soviet Union had to be dealt with, and the sooner the better before the United States became too strong. So he signed the order for Operation Barbarossa on the 13th of December 1940. Preparations should be complete by May 1941. The objective should be to establish an eastern border along a line from Archangel on the Sea of Murmansk to the River Volga, north of the Black Sea. As subsidiary operations 
The plan called for strong defensive positions to be established in Europe and Northwest Africa, for the British to be cleared out from the Mediterranean and the Near East with Italian help, and the oil fields of Iraq and Iran occupied, the Azores in the Middle Atlantic to be taken for air bases for future attacks on the United States and Canada, and the German army itself to be later reduced in size, but made more mobile with a core of 36 armoured and motorised divisions. We now turn to the Soviet Union, and in particular to the role of Joseph Stalin, the General Secretary of the Communist Party, and effectively the absolute ruler of the Soviet state. We know less about Soviet motives and thought at this time than any of the other major powers. Although Stalin was the ultimate decision maker, we don't know how much he was involved in ruling or who were his most important advisors. Remember, this book is written quite a while back. Before the German invasion of Poland in 1939, Stalin could have chosen to either ally with the French and British to resist German expansion or to remain neutral, extracting a suitable price for Soviet non-involvement. He may, of course, have doubted the sincerity of Britain and France in seeking an alliance with the Soviet Union, which might well have left the Soviets fighting Germany on their own. On the other hand, non-involvement might have led to the capitalist powers merely weakening each other, which would be to the advantage of the Soviet Union. Stalin never had to justify his policies to anyone. There was no public opinion. The Communist Party was obedient to him, and anyone who was educated and ambitious would likely be a member. Those outside the Communist Party could be ignored or snubbed, even the Red Army was not independent following the Army Purge of 1937. Thus, Soviet policies could decisively follow raison d'etat. In secretly allying with the Nazis, Stalin offered the vital economic and strategic aid to Germany in return for the partition of Poland and a free hand to expand into Finland, the Baltic states and part of Romania. The rapid defeat of France must have been bad news for Stalin, but Britain's continuing resistance would have been welcome as prolonging the value of Soviet non-involvement to the Germans. Stalin demonstrated the Soviets' continuing reliability and value to the Germans by promptly delivering the supplies they wanted, whilst bargaining for further advantages. The evidence, including from since Stalin's death, suggests that he was surprised by the German attack on the Soviet Union, despite receiving warnings from several reliable sources. He may have thought that the massive German troop movements in the spring of 1941 were an elaborate maneuver to fool the British into relaxing their guard against an invasion, a story put out by the Germans themselves. Or maybe it was a diplomatic bluff he probably thought it was inconceivable that Hitler would risk a protracted two-front war. But Hitler wasn't intending a protracted war. He expected that the Soviet Union would be defeated in ten weeks, so that the German troops could then be withdrawn for an attack on the British and Americans in August. Barbarossa was actually delayed by four weeks in order for the Germans to crush Yugoslavia, but the preparations were due to be completed by the 15th of May. The actual attack began on the 22nd of June, which even with the 10-week ten uh, ten period which the Germans had allowed themselves would have meant that it would be over by the 31st of August. This delay was not considered important at the time, although later it has been, and even without the attack on the Balkans, the wet spring might have forced a delay. The slush and mud lasted longer than usual, and the River Bug was still too wide in early June for a secure crossing from the German into the Soviet occupation zone in Poland. 
the achievement of the German army in Barbarossa is amazing by military standards. This was the most effective land army ever assembled, and it won the biggest victories in the history of war. The Germans were far superior to their opponents as a fighting force, and on average as individual soldiers. But this superiority was not enough to defeat the Soviet forces and conquer European Russia. The campaign was decisive in World War II as a whole. The survival of the Soviet Union by the end of the year determined the pattern of the rest of the war and also of the post-war world. The success of the Soviet armies enabled the Anglo-American coalition to join in defeating Hitler in far less time and at far less cost to themselves than would otherwise have been the case. So that's my uh, video of uh, this first part of Parker's chapter. Uh, thank you very much for listening and in particular thanks to my patrons for their kind support and encouragement without which these videos would be hard to make. And if you want to support my channel, you're very welcome to do so. Uh, like, comment and share on the videos. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. It really does help the channel. And I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll talk about the German and Soviet forces and the 1941 campaign. Have a good day.